Welcome to Between the Vines. My name is Kevin Martin. I'm here with Jennifer Phillips Russo. We're the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program with Cornell and Penn State University. Uh, we wanted to bring you another weekly update. I think we missed an update, but hopefully you've been enjoying our musings with Musa, those special uh, episodes that we actually previously recorded uh, before Andy had a chance to retire. We wanted to um, really focus on some of the things he's done over his career that I think actually a lot of growers probably have heard him talk about those issues, um, but we wanted it in a permanent form permanent format. So in case there's something you forgot, you can always use it as a reference. Uh, obviously the pesticide guides that he worked on for many years and towards the end of his career edited are another good resource in that way. But um, sometimes it's good just to hear it and see it described. So, so enjoy those. We do have one more left. Uh, and I think we'll probably bring you that uh, either next week or the, or the week after, depending on what else is going on in vineyards. Uh, so we'll we'll leave you guessing with that. But but for now, we have some upcoming events that we want to talk about and some things going on in vineyards. So uh, with that, I will give Jennifer uh, a minute to talk about to talk about what she's been up to in vineyards. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So there's a lot going on. Number one thing that we keep talking about every time I see someone is how dry it is around here. It is very dusty driving all along the at least route 20 in western new york you can see just blowing across i was out in vineyards all day today we were doing some of the caps program which is with ag and markets we where we look for invasive species and we actually lure them in we're looking for the christmas berry worm the european grape berry moth and also i'm forgetting one g it's gbvm so we can We'll figure that out for you. Like, just know that I was out in all the vineyards and certified nurseries, checking traps and trying to find those all day. So it gave me a chance to look around in these vineyards that I've been in. A lot of them are really crunchy. <laughs> Terminated, thank you. Those cover crops and ground cover that you have in your middle rows, giving your uh, vines the best chance of giving the nutrients and water that are in the soil. We have a lot going on in regards to this is the time you should be looking at your crop estimation. So at Clarel and Concord grapes, we officially called bloom on June 8th. Research has shown that at 30 days after bloom in the Concord berry curve, that the berries are approximately 50% of their final berry weight. So it's an easy math if you wanna do it at 30 days after bloom. We do understand that sometimes that doesn't work out for you and sometimes you're a little bit later and we have given you a guide. It's gone out in the newsletter that's gone out this week to all of our members. And also it can be found on our website. There's a guide there to help you through to figure out what that crop estimation is. But crop estimation is important, not only for you to know how to balance your vines so you're not overcropped or undercropped, but also for our processors so that they can schedule tank and labor and deliveries. So make sure you get out there. If you have any questions on how to do it, please give me a call or send me an email, call my cell phone, and um, which is 716-640-5350. And we can walk you through that. Go ahead, yeah, so, you want to say something. <laughs> I mean, one of the other reasons we do crop estimation is in the same way that processors need, you know, information for purchasing and tank planning, you know, I think growers can also use that information if they want to use it and can really monetize it by creating a, a harvest schedule that's more efficient for them. Um, right. The most obvious example, and I think growers do typically try to avoid this issue, is underestimating their crop. So if they underestimate their crop with the processor, that can turn into a scheduling, I mean, you know, nightmare. Um, <laughs> And, and this, you know, this pertains to, you know, essentially this, this really boils down to the trucker. So in terms of scheduling, scheduling is done through trucking. So sometimes the grower who is farming the grapes is the trucker. Sometimes the harvester, uh, if it's a custom harvest operation, that person is doing the trucking. Sometimes the there's just a trucking company doing the trucking. So any errors in that system 
for the actual trucking part of it affect everybody underneath it. So, you know, if you're just a grower that's that's doing a crop estimation and you're sharing scheduling with another grower because you're sharing a trucker, um, th that all boils down to those crop estimates and and getting those schedules are, you know, are, are that scheduling takes place at that level. So everybody then is short schedules if there's a chronic underestimation of crop. I don't necessarily think that that's going to be a common problem this year. Um, you know, when I look at what I think produces errors in crop estimation that go in that direction, those things don't appear to be occurring this year in the same way that they have in other years. Uh, you know, I think um, when we see larger berries, that tends to make it a little more problematic because people don't necessarily estimate their berry size very well. I think when we see very large crops, sometimes crop estimation gets a little bit more difficult. Even for people who are doing crop estimation, it becomes problematic for them to say, trust that crop estimate. Because we know that crop estimation is not perfect. We know that berry size beyond 30 days will influence uh, your crop estimation. And that is, but, but the issue with that, I think, is that it's largely an unknown number. It could be too big or too small. So if you continually say, hedge your bet in one direction, um, it, it's based on weather. It's not based on an error in the model. So, so if you're continually hedging in one direction and the weather pattern changes, um, the model works just fine within its limits. So then you have an error in your crop estimation on top of the error that you may have introduced. And I think we did see some of that last year. So, so let's say, you know, the model was predicting three gram berries you thought maybe because the, it said like 15 ton to the acre that maybe they were actually going to be 2.8 gram berries and turns out they were 3.3 gram berries that's well within what we think the model is capable of performing but all of a sudden you're off by a factor that's really problematic <laughs> thank you for talking through that i could also say that dr terry bates sent out an email yesterday because they do monitor concord berry weights every season and the fresh berry curve is running a little below average. This was at 28 days after bloom. So the berries, but they also change very quickly during this stage. And um, we're still heading towards that 50% of final berry weight at 30 days after bloom, which turns out to be tomorrow for Claro. And it looks like they're, normally they come in around three gram berries and now they're predicting it to be about 2.8 to 2.9 gram berries. So it's about 5% below average. But like Kevin said, that can change with the weather. Last year, it never stopped raining and the berries just kept swelling. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, there's, and along with that, this seems to be a very typical year if you look at historical averages, at least in terms of weather related to temperature and bloom date. But, you know, know your bloom date. Um, and if you know your bloom date, you're you're more able to do crop estimation at 30 days, because if you're off by two or three days at 30 days, particularly, that's that's a pretty big problem at 50 days. I don't know that it's a big deal. Obviously, you're not going to do a lot of crop adjustment if you are doing crop estimation at 50 or 60 days. Um, but certainly that will give you an estimate for the processor in a timely way. It, and if, if that's all you need, you know, if you're not making decisions about spraying with your crop estimate, then maybe that could work. But I would, you know, encourage growers to go out and do some estimation close to 30 days and keep track of that bloom date. Use your LERGP calendar to write it down. Um, Thank you for saying that. That was my next thing. <laughs> and, and, you know, in doing it that way, you know, I think when we make decisions, particularly about any spray scheduling or material purchasing or application going forward, you need to know what your crop is. Uh, you know, if I, if I got a call that, you know, somebody was asking me what they should be spraying right now, there's a bunch of information you need to have before you make a really good decision about what the answer to that question is. Um, you know, we need to know if you have it, what your crop level looks like to know how important it is to provide powdery mildew protection going forward. 
Uh, that's that's just one example. We, we sort of need to know that for berry moth to a certain degree. Um, not so much. What we certainly need to know is wild grape bloom in your area. Ho hopefully you're close to a weather station. If not, you can buy one. The, the model that predicts wild grape bloom really isn't bad. Sometimes it's better if you are close enough than actually going out and seeing wild grape bloom because you may be observing wild grape bloom that is not the wild grape that the model was based on or it may be growing up the side of a tree next to a heater duct you know vent yeah. on next to your shop like we've seen all of these things so there are definitely times when the model outperforms the the observation but if you're away from a, a station then that model can really break down so it makes sense to really try to track your your wild grape bloom if you're not close to a, a weather station and this year it looks like everything's within two to three days uh at least on the bloom side so um what we what we can do is you know we can take a look and see how those models have progressed since then and right now it's going to be in our early sites it's too late to spray for berry moth at least ideally you probably have today if you're seeing this on friday to spray uh, but it's honestly a little too late and in some of the later sites um, there is still a little bit of time to spray for great berry moth but it's going to have to happen this weekend i'd have to check the forecast maybe monday is going to be acceptable in certain places but that's about it we're certainly done using Intrepid and Altacore, I think, in all of our sites. Um, I, I shouldn't say that. We might have one more day with Intrepid or Altacore, depending on where you're located. But we're just about done with those, and it doesn't take long after that that it is the contact sprays. It's also too late for those. Um, not to say you can't put it on, but your, your effectiveness is going to be very decreased, and within three or four days from now. So by Tuesday or Wednesday, it's really just too late and there's probably not a point of putting it on. So I, I think, you know, we've talked about it. I think a lot of growers use the model. I'm assuming most of those areas that needed berry moth have gotten them. Yeah. And we talked a lot about that of our coffee pots, just as a reminder, we have this month only left of coffee pots. So if you are looking for credits and you need a couple, you need to join every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Look for the schedule on lergp.cce.cornell.edu to find that list of the coffee pot schedule there. So there's one more virtual coming up, and I believe that's next week. Yes, Kevin? I believe it's next yes. week. Yes, yeah. So we'll have one more virtual evening coffee pot. Um, that will be on July 13th. We will also have a coffee pot on July 13th at 10 a.m. at Liberty Vineyards. Um, and then we have, I shouldn't say we, um, <laughs> there is a coffee pot meeting. The, the following one is at Beckman Farms. The 20th is at Beckman We're Farms. Pulling Andy out of retirement because um, he didn't, he did not mention that he was retiring when we scheduled that coffee pot meeting and we ended up I think you scheduled the conference to attend and I scheduled a, a vacation. So he's going to he's going to come out of retirement and join everybody with a couple of other Penn Staters like Brian Head um, at 10 a.m. on July 20th. That might be a good chance for you guys if you didn't know he was retiring or you didn't get to say your last hurrah or thank you to show up and see Andy. Yes. And then July 27th, we will be back in Niagara County. Uh, at Arrowhead Spring Winery for our last coffee pot of the season. So that gives you, um, if you count the virtual one, that gives you one, two, three more chances. And then in addition to that, we also have, if you just want information, not credits, on July 11th, which is Monday, um, at nine o'clock in the morning, we have our labor meeting. That's going to focus on H2A. Uh, please register for that, although I will say it's not a required registration. There is no fee associated with it. We were a little bit concerned that maybe um, there would be a lot of interest in attending and but also kind of surprised. Mm -hmm. So so I guess I'm not too surprised that it looks like people are a little busy and may not be attending that meeting. 
Um, but we do really want to make sure we give you that opportunity because this would be about the last chance that you would have if you don't start planning for H2A now, it, it, it'll essentially be too late. I mean, it would make more sense to do some of this stuff when growers are less busy, um, but you can't work out an H2A program in November after harvest. You can't really even do it effectively if this is your first time through in like in Concord vineyards in our region, we sort of have a lull in August and even that's too late. So, so this is sort of the best thing we can do uh, because the problem, I mean, labor has been a problem for a long time, but it, it feels like in 2022, it became very immediate and, and very severe quickly. So, so it is a new problem in that sense that it is more severe. So we wanted to be able to give you an opportunity to fix that problem by 2023. Um, we'll have a grower roundtable, which I think is sort of the most honest way to deal with both the good or the very good and also the bad that comes with H2A. So you know what you're getting into and why it works and why you do it. Uh, so July 11th at 9 a.m. I'm sorry, I'm giggling because, you know, it happens to be doing work from home, podcasting from home, and now somebody's ringing the doorbell. So I'm trying to keep myself muted on that. Thank you, Kevin. I also would like to remind everybody that on July, or sorry, August 2nd, August 2nd, we are having our summer demo day at Clarel or the Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Laboratory. Please register for that. We are applying. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we should have DEC credits for that as well as PDA credits. Um, we don't, I don't think we have a solid number of how many credits we have left or we will have for that event. Um, but uh, it will be from 8 a.m. to 4.30 on August 2nd. And the cost for that event is um, $25 for LERGP members. And so we do have registration up on our website at lergp.cce.cornell.edu under that events tab where you can register for any of our events, events that require registration. Thank you. I'm excited for that because there will be some soil health. There will be two soil pits dug. Also, our research that's going on at the lab that we do to, you know, we, we bring research-based solutions and local knowledge together so we're trying to just make everything more efficient now you can get sort of a, an inside look at what's going on at the lab and what we are working on to bring to you once we have all of that data so please feel free to join us there sorry thank you for covering that kevin he saw my eyes get wide as dog was barking and children were walking in the door <laughs> it happens <laughs> i usually actually like doing a podcast from home because for me it tends to be quieter or at least um the sound quality tends to be a little bit better, uh, but yeah, you know, it happens from home or in the <laughs> office. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that pretty much covers sort of the immediate things that are happening that our growers in the region need to know about, uh, you know, it, great berry moth, if you haven't dealt with it yet, that is an emergency right now. Um, uh, we have some growers who are starting to feel like getting credits is a bit of an emergency if you were not part of the virtual party that went along went on for two years you know if if you were a part of that it was very easy to get credits if you don't have the internet it was next to impossible to get credits so these are your sort of opportunities to catch up um, depending on you know what kind of cycle you have whether you're in pa or or new york uh, and so like jennifer started to mention the summer conference on august 2nd will be your last opportunity before harvest to get credits with our program. Hopefully, I mean, we haven't heard back yet, so they're, they've been applied for, but. I'm sure we'll get something. But we also have the um, Hort Society meeting, the right. Twilight meeting, that, that is another way to get credits as well. Yes, and that will be at Gravel Pit Park if you've been there before uh, in Northeast Pennsylvania. <laughs> On what's the date of that meeting? <laughs> Is that the 27th or the 3rd of August? Do you remember? Off the top of my head, I don't. And I don't okay. wanna say the wrong date. Okay. I just know that it's like one after another. I wanna say it's the 27th because we have a Niagara County it's, coffee okay. pot. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Right, it's the same day as that coffee pot meeting. So 
So it's at July 27th at Gravel Pit Park. Um, and that is a very similar meeting, sort of. Uh, we did actually, we did have it last year, but we hadn't had it for a couple of years. So if you're familiar with that meeting uh, and you're interested in going, that's one more way to get credits. And then, like I said, August 2nd will be your last chance. And I think we will get some credits. They have been applied for. Um, in terms of going, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, so kind of switching gears, there are a couple of things that we should talk about and trying to figure out how to segue into each of them. So I think maybe we should talk about the television segment first, because the last two sort of go together with the parrot bot resistance and buying your cover crop seed. But yes. yeah, we have a few we have a few more things to talk about this week. Um, I don't think any of them are emergencies for grape growers, but probably one of them felt like a bit of an emergency for Jennifer. Um, yeah, a little bit of an emergency. Researchers. So uh, go ahead. So um, I'm sure many of you are aware, or at least you have made me know that you are aware of it. There was a Facebook post that was released from what the town of West Seneca in Erie County, New York, that a spotted lantern fly had been found in Erie County. And then it was picked up by the news channels and also in the Buffalo area and reported on. So I scrambled because people were calling me, texting me, emailing me. I scrambled to find out that information for you. And yes, there was an adult spotted lantern fly found in a pool in West Seneca. However, if you are aware of the life cycle of this insect in our area, we do not have any adults yet. It is possible that there might be a couple depending on if they were again, like Kevin said earlier with the wild grape bloom, an egg mass near asphalt that got heated up. It is possible, but this, um, I wouldn't get too worried about this finding just yet. It has to be confirmed. It was told to me by Ag and Markets that yes, there was one found, but they're sending people out to do a grid search. I can tell you that our team after the coffee pot on Wednesday of this week stopped by that area and did a grid search in a park next to it. And we did not find any signs of it. I'm not saying that this is, isn't um, cause to be alarmed, I'm just saying that maybe this is cause for you to go out and start scouting in your vineyards to see if you can find any nymphs. They would be the black and white dot stage right now, and some could also be in the red, black, and white dot stage. But as for adults, it also could be the fact that maybe it hitchhiked up from somebody in the quarantine zone that came to visit and they found one. So we've said it all along that it's not if it gets here, but when it gets here, and it's going to be a numbers game. So my best suggestion for you all is just to keep your eyes open and watch. And if you do see it, report it as soon as possible to New York Ag and Markets, or call us for if you're, there's been a lot of tiger moths out and people have been bringing me tiger moths and thank you for bringing them to me because it means you're looking, but um, we don't have adults of the spotted lantern fly just yet. They start July to December. So that was a bit of a firestorm that happened. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you, Kevin. Your lips are moving, but you are not talking. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of impossible to tell right at this point where, where that came from. Although it seems likely that it was an adult that was alive last year, not this year, but yeah, like did it did it hatch in Pennsylvania or did it hatch in Erie County, New York? Who knows? But obviously, there's a reason to be. Once you see adults, there's a reason to be even more careful. I think they they have found a number of um, you know of the different instars. Like when you find it in a car or on a pallet, it doesn't necessarily mean that it spread. Like you just found the hitchhiker, and obviously there are more hitchhikers than the ones you find. So it, it does seem like it's an inevitable, but this could actually be indication not of a hitchhiker, but theoretically of a somewhat established population. And this is just the one that's found. We just don't have any way, any idea or way to know, but it sounds like, you know, with ag and markets coming out, if it is an established population, there's at least a chance that they will find it. And if it's not, I think you'll just 
kind of have to wonder because there it could be there and if it's small enough you wouldn't find it yet especially until they're adults exactly so just be on the lookout yep um what else do we have the next thing is is that we received your request from dr lynn sanoski who is um the weed scientist at cornell university and there have been confirmed horseweed or mare's towel that we frequently call it um, resistance to glyphosate and also paraquat. So she's actually looking for people who may have had escapes. And I've been in many vineyards today and saw a lot of escapes. Everything is crunchy brown, but the mare's tail is still surviving. So oh, if yeah. you are one of those people and you know that you've sprayed and you've had a great program and the mare's tail is still prolific in your vineyards, you can email us and we'll get you in touch with Lynn Sanoski, but she's looking to collect some seeds this summer and this fall. Her email address, if you want to just email her to let her know that you have some, is she's, give, we also posted it in our crop update, is lms438 at cornell.edu. And that kind of segues us into one way to control mare's tail or horseweed, I saw you laugh when I said that, is cover cropping. So you can use cover cropping to sort of smother out the weeds. And if you're going to start planting your, your cover crop, it should be happening by the end of this month, beginning of August. So you need to then have the seed to do so. So Kevin, I know that you wrote on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of mare's tail, it is not perfect in years like this, right? Because we mare's tail one of its advantages it's definitely very good at dealing with drought stress more so than certainly grasses and other weeds um, so what i think you will find is you're going to need a, a material that kills mare's tail um, and that will need to be used if you see mare's tail now and, and you already see it actively growing you will you will not be able to control it with your cover crop that you plant in the next couple three or four weeks depending on how you time it um, so your termination will need to include something that terminates that mare's tail the goal i think is to hopefully make sure that you don't need that material next year for that termination yes. depending on how much mare's tail you have i think depends on how realistic that goal is you know i think you can substantially reduce it i think some growers have reached that goal after you know they maybe they had what looked like a field of mare's tail and after two or three years they were able to not use a rely or cheetah type product but i don't i don't think it's instant and and the best years are not years like this unless this year changes where cover crops struggle to get established because of moisture issues in the soil right yeah right so um you know one of the things we talked about or i talked about in that article was just you know now is the time for seed selection that this might be a week before it normally is you know in terms of time for seed selection you know some growers do get their cover crop seeds lined up a month ago but by the 14th of July is probably very close to a, a drop dead date, may even be now. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you line up your, uh, you know, just because of supply chain issues, you're going to want to make sure you line up what you need now. Uh, and then that will give you the opportunity to plant it over the next month. And, you know, I don't have a really great strategy to tell you when to plant it. You want to plant it right before the moisture becomes available, <laughs> but uh, you know, if I knew when that was going to happen, I make I, a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we do know, I mean, one of the big failures in cover crops is going to be when you seed and then there's no moisture because most things won't germinate and things like mare's tail are able to cope and they will germinate and grow and they can even be four or five inches tall before some of your grasses start to germinate. And so then it just really won't work very well. So, you know, I think be careful this year with your with your uh, your cover crops. And uh, one of the things you normally used to be able to do or could do is to make sure you have 
six or seven pounds or maybe even a little more of buckwheat in your mix. Buckwheat's in short supply this year. At the very least, the price has doubled. So if you can get some and you want to spend that kind of money on it, uh, which I do think makes sense if you can get it, you know, if it's $10 a pound, then maybe it doesn't make sense. But, but if it's $2 a pound, it may end up being the most expensive part of your mix, which is weird. I said, really buckwheat was not that, um, but it may, it may need to be in your mix. You can reduce or eliminate your clovers if you are pretty confident that you are planting into almost no sort soil moisture and you just don't know what else to do. Uh, if things turn around, then you can, then you can change that up. You can, um, increase your seed rates of your clover and reduce or eliminate the buckwheat. I don't know how flexible you're going to be at, be at that, you know, considering you have to line up your seeds right now. But I think playing with seed rates is probably the best practice because you want to have at least some buckwheat because we know it's dry now. And, um, you, you know, you don't want to save seed for two years. So that's not really an option like it is with some other things in your practices. But, but you can certainly play around with seed rates. And um, you can survive without, you know, you can survive without clover if you need to. It's not going to do very well if it's extremely dry. Um, one of the things growers have been doing is lower rates of grasses and mixing them to try to compensate for varying conditions of soil moisture. And um, that's been pretty effective. It doesn't increase the cost too much because they are lowering their rates of seed. So. I think overall biomass production doesn't take too big of a hit. Um, it is going to be substantially less than like a super dense uh, planting of ryegrass, but that's really expensive right now. And I don't expect anybody to do it. So, and there are some vineyards where the ryegrass has gotten away from people as well. But like Kevin was saying, I think your best bet this year is to use a multi-species mix because some will just do better than others and we can't predict the weather. So. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if you can avoid making your decisions about what seeds to purchase or, or at least some of them and mix them later on, you know, I would avoid something like a pea because I just, at least until I start to see some improvement in soil moisture. Taking out um, all my legumes and all your conversation. <laughs> I just, I haven't seen them perform well enough when there's no soil moisture. Well, that's, that's saying that we're not going to have any more soil moisture. And I do understand what you're saying. If you were right. planting this week, yes. But I mean, yeah. who knows what's going to happen two weeks from now. I mean, if you, yeah, if you procrastinate on planting until August 1st, that's probably a valid thing to do. If, if that means that you're, that's the timing where soil moisture works works like if all of a sudden you get a bunch of rain the first week of august or the last week of july then that's the right window to plant in and if that occurs and you can run out and buy a legume then what you might be able to do then i think it makes a lot of sense i would um, agree. agree with that and, and legumes are subject to some of the same things we're seeing in other cover crops so we said the price of buckwheat doubled the price of certain legumes has also doubled, um, but not all of them. So just pay attention to what you buy. Don't go and to your cover crop seed provider and say, I want my mix, like the same mix I had last year. Don't do that because you may have been using something like, I don't know, there's a lot of examples, but you may have been using something like a medium red clover because it was cheaper and that's what you wanted. And you could use a lower seed rate and now all of a sudden crimson clover is cheaper instead of twice as much as medium red. So you want to, you know, pay attention to that cost and just look up the price of the individual seeds so you can make those decisions. Ryegrass is another great example. Typically a ryegrass blend would have been historically a little bit cheaper than some of the other grass grasses. And now it's probably going to be, and this will depend a little bit on what you're mixing with it and your seed rates, but it should probably be the most expensive grass. Mm. Um, so that's a little bit different. And, you know, I think there was some issues with productions of certain seeds and it probably hit some seeds harder than others. So we aren't seeing necessarily a uniform increase in cover crops seed prices. It is not across the board, but it has hit certain species pretty hard. 
And that's just because all that rain we had last fall, they also okay. had all that rain. So things just weren't growing. Well, we covered a lot today. I know that's a lot of information. Note that what we talk about in this podcast is also in our crop updates and in our newsletters, and then also things that crop up during the week while we're here. So you can- Yeah, not always, but yeah, we do try to cover it in, in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Um, and already, you know, I, we came out with a newsletter. I don't, is it out yet? I already have questions. About today. It from Grower. Yeah. <laughs> I, but for somehow I, somebody leaked it. I don't know what, but I already have questions from growers about my articles. So some of that got addressed today. Um, you know, because a lot of times when we put out information, it spurs a, a nice discussion. And this is a, one of the ways to continually be in touch with our growers so that we can have that discussion with everybody, not just with the grower who read it and thought of something or had a different experience um, or, or, you know, sometimes we put something out there and that just, you know, creates uh, curiosity and we want to talk about it more. And so sometimes when something goes out there, we don't know what direction you guys are going to take it. So, so this allows us to, you know, this platform allows us to share that with everybody. So, so if you're seeing a newsletter and you're like, this sounds a lot like the, the podcast, that's why. And I would encourage you to keep reading because we, we try not to make those newsletters too long, but they will be different than what you are hearing here. We don't just read our newsletters to you. So, so yes, a lot of times the topics are the same, but, but the granular discussion is intentionally different. Well, I think that's all that I have. Do you have that's anything it. else you need to chat about? No, nope. hopefully we see everybody on Monday or at least everybody that fits in our 75 person meeting room. And we get a bunch of labor here next year and we won't be talking about all of our labor shortages, but we'll, we'll see. And other Thanks than that, for joining us, everyone. other than that, we'll see you here next week. Have a great week.